Today I want to talk and turn to God's Word to have us look at God's ultimate purpose for you. The question is, why are you here on earth? Why were you made in the first place? We're going to talk about your ultimate purpose and the gospel invitation. I have good news. God is inviting us to respond to this invitation. And here's the invitation. Let God guide you to your great goal. Let God guide you to your great goal in life, while you're here on earth, and bridging all the way into eternity. Why are you here? Your ultimate purpose. As we consider that and understand God's gospel invitation, we're going to be turning to uh, what I'm titling an unchained soul song. That sounds exciting, doesn't it? An unchained soul song, the Magnificat. This is Mary's song, and it's part of our ongoing sub-series as we work our way through a much longer series on the gospel according to Luke. We've got a sub-series in chapters 1 and 2 of Luke called Believe Before Dawn. Believe before dawn, before the sun rises, believe. And that's what God invites us to do, and that's what we're learning in a particular way from Luke chapter 1, most definitely, and heading into Luke chapter 2. So today we're going to be turning to some passages of Scripture from the Old Testament, from specifically the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. And then chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, the prayer or the song of Hannah. And then we're going to turn to uh, Luke chapter 1. And in Luke chapter 1, we're going to read some of the verses we've already covered a couple times in different ways from what would be called the beginning of the visitation of Mary to Elizabeth. And then we'll also be looking to Mary's song, her unchained soul song. So let's open up God's word and hear from God's word. Again, 1 Samuel. Now, the context of this, just to remind you, uh, we're dealing with um, an, uh, a man of Ephraim, uh, an Ephrathite named Elkanah. He's got two wives, one named Penina, who is fertile and has lots of children and is very happy about that and gloats over Elkanah's second wife. You know, you're not supposed to have two wives. <laughs> kind of a backstory to this. Um, and um, anyway, the second wife is named Hannah, and God has closed her womb. She cannot have children. And she's very distraught. And at the same time, we're told that there's a famine in the land. So you got famine, or in other words, barrenness in the land, and then barrenness in the womb of Hannah. Well, they go to Shiloh, which is where the tabernacle is at this point. This is during the, you know, the latter stages of what we would call the time of the judges. There is, you know, Jerusalem is not taken yet for Israel. There is no temple at all, okay? The tabernacle with the Ark of the Covenant is at Shiloh or Shiloh. Uh, and so uh, what we're told is that Elkanah is apparently a very faithful Israelite, and he goes to the tabernacle at the feast time. He goes at least once a year, and this is most likely, just to set the stage for you so you understand this, this is probably in the fall, in the days of awe, you know, running from Rosh Hashanah, uh, the, the new year, uh, through uh, Yom Kippur, and then heading into tabernacles. Okay, so they're probably there for a while, at least intersecting with all or part of what I just mentioned. So uh, they've had the big festival, and everybody's eaten, and Hannah is distraught. You ever been to a party where you're the sad person and everybody else is happy? So this is Hannah, okay? Uh, picking up at verse 9. After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple, of you know, the house, the, the tabernacle of the Lord. And she, Hannah, was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O oh, Lord of hosts, Yahweh Sabaoth, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant, of your female slave, of your maidservant, and remember me and not forget your servant, 
but will give to your female servant, your female slave, a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. He's going to be dedicated to you, Lord. He's even going to be under Nazarite oath, okay, per numbers. Now, what happens if you remember the story is God opens her womb. She has, you know, she's going to have a son. She has a son. His name is Samuel. And now we turn to Hannah's prayer or song in chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. And Hannah prayed and said, My heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth smiles at my enemies because I rejoice in in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none beside you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more very proudly. Let that arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, but the feeble bind on strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, and she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills, and the Lord brings to life. He brings down to Sheol and raises up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low, and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones. But the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed, of his Messiah. Then to the visitation and Mary's song. Luke chapter 1, verse 39. In those days, that is after the annunciation to her and the conception by the Holy Spirit in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. In those days, Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me? that the mother of my Lord should come to me. For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For he has looked on the humble estate of his female servant, his female slave. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. So here we have the visitation, and we have Elizabeth pregnant, six months pregnant, and Mary newly pregnant. Have you ever been around expecting mothers who are excited? 
Anyway, probably, maybe it's only me that's been around a mother who's excited. But expecting mothers can be very enthusiastic, particularly if they got a little bit of sleep the night before. Now, Elizabeth, of course, has waited her whole life. She's an old woman. She's, this is a total miracle. <laughs> you know, she's long past her cycle, yet suddenly she's pregnant you know, by uh, the amazing work of God. Mary, of course, was not inviting a pregnancy. She's just betrothed. You know, this, is a little, this is definitely premature, uh, but it's God's plan. But here they are, two very enthusiastic women, uh, expecting women. And that reminds me to ask myself and to ask you, about what are you enthusiastic? You enthusiastic about it? Pretty much anybody I know gets enthusiastic about something. It could be about the kind of music they like. It could be about their, you know, Marvel movie that they like. <laughs> it could be about politics or their particular brand of politics or whatever they saw on social media today. They just got to send it out, you know. I'll spend more time sending out social media feeds than I will actually worshiping God and coming to church because that's what enthuses me. You know, you find out, and this is to the point of the word, what someone's gods are by what they get enthusiastic about. You remember, of course, the Greek, right, in Okay, it means the God or gods that are in you, the gods that possess you, the gods that possess your soul. And if I can see what excites you, I can find out what your real gods are and what your real religion is. You may say it's Jesus, but it may be something about sports, it may be something about a beach house, it may be something about clothes, it may be something about movies, it may be something about politics and your brand of politics. In other words, same kind of thing, what inspires you? What breathes into your soul life? There are a lot of spirits of this age, folks. The Bible tells us to test the spirits and to go with the one true spirit who brings life, and that is God. Enthusiasm, inspiration, kind of interesting here. These ladies are definitely enthusiastic, and it turns out they're enthusiastic about the one true God and about his plans. Let's go to the other side of that coin. Soulless worship. Soulless worship. Worship without soul. Prayers without any soul really in them. What are these things? You could say, you could try to fill in the blank with, their, well, they're boring. You know, the way I do church, the way my grandparents do church, the way my friends do church is kind of boring, but we need to do it. You know, just like we need to eat broccoli, even if I don't like it, because I guess it's good for me. No, 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 it's not just boring. It's not just bad. It's blasphemy. And if you're following the notes, you can go ahead and fill in the blank there. Soulless worship and prayers. Well, I guess I'll say my prayers today. You know what that is? That's not just weak. That's not just lame. That's blasphemy. A damnable violation of the third commandment. You know what the third commandment says, right? You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. If you're going to call yourself a Christian, if you're going to pray in the name of Jesus, the Lord of heaven and earth, raised from the dead, who breathes life into the dead, if you're going to pray in his name, if you're going to come and call yourself a Christian worshiping in his name and not be inspired, it's an abomination to the Father. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord, you know, we get the tag on the third commandment. You remember this, right? For the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who takes the Lord's name in vain. So what are we made for? Who are we? What are we supposed to be? Genesis 2, 7, the Lord God breathed into the man the breath of life and made the man a what? You know, unfortunately, most English translations, living creature, but you know you've heard me translate this for you before, a bunch of sermons. A living soul. The nefesh chaya. 
Okay, a living soul, a throat open to be filled by the Spirit of God to be in a living, lively relationship with God. To do what? To reflect God's glory and to serve his dominion. That's what Adam was made for. That's what we are made for. So what's our ultimate purpose? We kind of answered it, right? Come on, good Presbyterians, you're supposed to know this is going to give you an answer to a bunch of the blanks I have on these sermon notes, or at least hedge you in the right direction. What is our ultimate purpose? What is man's chief end? Come on, come on, go ahead. To do what? To glorify God and to enjoy God fully forever. Okay, now notice this. Presbyterian types, I really want you to pay attention today. Now, notice this. Glorify and enjoy are inseparable. Sometimes I have people say, well, I get the glorify thing, but I just don't get the enjoy thing. And I'll say, you don't get the glorify thing if you don't get the enjoy thing. Because if you are truly glorifying God, it's not like, well, I guess I'll sing the song, you know. That, that is not glorifying God. That is not reflecting the greatness of God at all. That's the opposite of glorifying God. Okay? So, in other words, to glorify God includes, is inseparable. With, they're married. Enjoying God and glorifying him are the same, you know, they go together, right? So, we are made to enjoy God and to glorify him in the midst of our lives, not just in a worship service, definitely in a worship service, but out in the world too. And you know what? In your house, in your home, when you do family devotions, if it's like, oh gosh, we got to sit through another family devotion, let's get this over with fast. That is not enjoying and glorifying God. Come on. Welcome God into your heart and soul and your family. So, speaking of Presbyterians and standard, you know, references to Presbyterians and other reform type folks, are the chosen really frozen? Are the chosen, to hold that thought, because if you, if you answer, yeah, of course they are. You know, they're, they're just doing the right things. Let's, let's, let's go to the word, okay? Jesus said, God seeks those who will worship him how? Gritting their teeth and just like obediently doing it even though they hate it? Is that what, he's, is that what God's looking for? Jesus says God seeks those who will worship him in, fill it in, spirit and in truth. Okay, in spirit, in spirit, our spirits responding to the spirit of God and testifying to God and calling out Abba, Daddy, to God. Um, okay, well, let's go ahead and go to the whole counsel of God because we've got that from Jesus. What kind of person would this look like or, or, or be like? Okay, same language now. Remember, Jesus says God is, the Father is seeking seeking those who will worship him in spirit and truth. Whom did God seek in the Old Testament? Well, we know famously God sought David. Now, David, we got to be honest about David. David's got some serious flaws to him. <laughs> he, 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 he commits some serious sin. But one thing you can never accuse of David is soulless worship and prayer. David is the polar opposite of soulless worship. And, and it turns out that is the man. And that's the man, by the way, that God sets as his template, looking us ahead typologically to the Messiah when the Messiah comes, right? The son of David. Not just a covenant line, but typologically too, okay? So what is David like? So 1 Samuel 1, 13, 14, you know, when God rejects Saul as king over Israel, famously the word is God has sought a man after God's own heart. What, is, what, what does God want? What kind of person is God interested in, like for a real relationship? Are you interested in like being in a relationship with God? Well, let's look at what kind of person this was. David loved and glorified God with all his heart and all his soul and all his might. So let's keep asking this question, are the chosen, the ones that God chooses and seeks, are they actually frozen? Is that, is that the impression you get of David? Well, in case you, you haven't gotten the message that that's definitely wrong yet, 
Let's go to 2 Samuel 6.14. As David is bringing the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem, what does David do? Well, I guess we've got to bring the Ark in now. Hmm? David strips off his outer garments and dances before the Lord. Now, by the way, the frozen chosen Michal, the daughter of Saul, who's one of David's wives, hates David when she sees this. And she says, how undignified. You're doing this in front of people. And David's like, I belong to the Lord. I'll dance before him all day long and all night long if that's what he wants. I throw my hands up. I dance before the Lord. And David even puts on, you know, remember this, this is kind of, this is edgy. David puts on the ephod, the, 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 the priestly garment. Already, again, that's prophetic with who Jesus is going to be. You know, not just the king, but, okay, the priest. So David dances before the Lord with a little bit of activity. No, with all his might. Um, what about when David's in trouble? Oh, we could go to a dozen or more psalms. You, you, you know this, right? David writes over half the psalms in the Psalter. I mean, he loves to worship the Lord. When, when David was in the Judean desert, ever been in a desert and you don't have food or water? What would you be thinking about? Guess what David's thinking about? He's thinking about God. So look at this, verses three and five, three through five. Because your steadfast love, O Lord, is better than life. I'd rather have your love and die out here in the desert. This is awesome. As long as I got you, God. That's how passionately David worships the Lord. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. My parched lips <laughs> will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. Now, understand, he's got no food out here in the desert, very little. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. So David, in turn, gives us an invitation. Psalm 34, verse 3. What does David invite us to do with him? Now, he is the worshiper par excellence in the whole Old Testament. You know, back when I was in Hilton Head, I had a guy named Stan Smith joined my church. And Stan Smith was former number one tennis player in the world. Won Wimbledon, won the U.S. Open, you know, multiple doubles championships, Australian Open, Wimbledon. A great guy, sweetheart of a guy, I incredible tennis player. Um, and Stan would invite me to go hit tennis with him because at that time I was still playing tennis. So, um, you know, it's like, well, yeah, I'm okay, but Stan, seriously. So when you get the best or one of the best in the world inviting you to do something with him, should you do it? If Jack Nicholas said, hey, uh, let me go ahead and give you a little golf lesson today, would you take him up on <laughs> it? Mean, yeah, this is great. So David invites us to do what with him? To magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name forever. David invites us to glorify God and enjoy him, okay? Here's David's invitation. Now, now we got Mary's response. Mary says yes. Mary says, yes, I'm in. And we get the Magnificat. Now, um, the Magnificat, that's just from the, the Latin Vulgate translation from the first line here, Magnificat anima mea dominum. So that's just the Latin. That's why we have that kind of fancy term, Magnificat. Um, it's a soul song. It's a Thanksgiving psalm like Hannah's and like David's many Thanksgiving psalms. Uh, let's go to the visitation. I said we got these two enthusiastic pregnant women here, and uh, let's unpack a few first before, because I don't think I'm coming back to the visitation anymore. So I, I don't want to leave these, and these do play into how we understand about being excited about how awesome God is, okay? So there are some stunning first in the visitation segment here of uh, 139 through 156. First of all, you know in the Bible, right, you need two witnesses to certify something covenantally. Y'all remember this, right? You need two human witnesses. Um, so who, who are the, who are the, what's the duo of human witnesses that first testify to the Lord's coming in Jesus Christ? Is it some highfalutin dudes in the Sanhedrin, some like major rabbinic scholars or something like that? No, who are the first two human witnesses? 
fetus baby John in utero. Did you catch that? I mean, this is, this is astounding. John in utero and uh, pregnant Elizabeth. Those, those are your witnesses. Now, by the way, on the other side of the story, when Jesus rises from the dead, who are the first two witnesses to the risen Lord? Like the, the top dudes in the Sanhedrin? No, a couple of women, right? Okay, now let's keep moving. First spirit-filled prophecy in 400 years. You understand there has not been spirit-filled prophecy in Israel in 400 years until Jesus comes. Well, who is the first person on whom the Spirit is poured out as a human being to give human spoken prophecy? Once again, Elizabeth. Go figure. Okay? Zechariah probably could have, but he was stricken mute <laughs> because he didn't believe. So, so we got Elizabeth here. Um, first beatitude in the gospel according to Luke. This would be a trick question. Um, Tabor, just remember all these ones that I give to you now for our next Wednesday night trivia stuff. Okay, so you would think if you knew the Bible pretty well, you're like, well, I've got to go to uh, Luke 6 where Jesus starts laying out the Beatitudes, right, in the Sermon on the Plain. No, 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 back here. Back here. And yeah, kind of in 42, verse 42, but that's eulogy. That's, that's the, the eulogistic terminology there um, in 42, 43. But look at 45, right? It's the same term as Jesus' Beatitudes in the Greek New Testament. We get the first Makaria spoken by Elizabeth laying the Beatitude on Mary. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And that is the bridge that you need to know into Mary's Magnificat. Also, first full biblical interpretation in Luke. Yes, we have the majestic but very stark annunciations from Gabriel, but the first full biblical interpretation, in other words, connecting this all and laying it out is from Mary in the Magnificat. Very significant in Luke. You're connecting dots beyond what Gabriel has said through this Magnificat. And that then leads me into, okay, so there's three human Okay, songs in Luke 1 and 2. There's four total songs. We know these. We sing parts of these around Christmas and Advent time, right? There's three human songs, four total songs. So you've got Mary, Zechariah, the angelic host, the Gloria, you know, in Luke 2, and then Simeon's. Which is the first? Mary's. First of the great songs of the celebration of the coming of Jesus. Now let's go to a couple questions here. I'll just deal with these briefly, but a typical objection you'll get from liberal critical scholars and just people who read this is, okay, well, there's no way Mary, a little peasant girl, uh, you know, from Nazareth could have come up with this. A couple answers to that. Number one, number one, obviously the Holy Spirit can inspire whatever God wants to do. So God can make a, a donkey talk and bring prophecy if he wants to. God can make stone speak. But it's not just that. What we're being told here is this. Understand the history. Okay, Mary is from the faithful remnant of the Jews. She's from a faithful family. She's betrothed to a faithful, righteous man. Faithful Jews, definitely back then and all the way through today even, what do they do when they gather for worship every Shabbat, every, every Sabbath? What do they do at the major high holy days and feasts and festivals? They recite and sing scripture. Okay, from that time to this very day, what is the lead haftarah, okay, after the Torah reading at Rosh Hashanah, the beginning of the new year in the fall for the Jews? What is the first reading from the prophets? 1 Samuel 1, Hannah. What's the first song from the prophets sung? Hannah's song. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think a little girl who from the age of like three and four is singing songs and sings them all the way through her teenagehood could remember some of those words? What do you think? Moms? Dads? When my girls were growing up, the big thing was, you know, Taylor Swift, right? So, so and they, you know, they knew church songs too. But I guarantee you this, my daughters growing up 
could sing, you know, up to this day, can pull basically the entire corpus of Taylor Swift songs and apply different verses to different situations. This is who Mary is, and understand, she's not listening to other music. This is her soul song stuff. You know, the Psalms of David, Hannah's song, Miriam's song. This is what she sings, not only in worship, not only at uh, Rosh Hashanah and the, the days of awe, you know, in the fall, but all through when she's doing different things in her life. So it's just plain stupidity for liberal and critical scholars to act like, well, there's, hey, she didn't have scrolls. She didn't know any of this stuff. How could she have pulled? Because I can tell you this, every, basically every single word in her song hyperlinks to Old Testament passages. I mean, it's all from these things that she would have sung her whole life. Um, so you got the answer there. Could she have, you know, because even some evangelical writers that I read say, well, you know, she maybe said something, but Luke has elaborated under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. No, 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 this is from Mary. Should she have proclaimed? Well, all the way through Luke and Acts, um, famously at Pentecost, Simon Peter in his Pentecost sermon quotes from the prophet Joel and says, in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, on your sons and your daughters, they shall prophesy, even on my male servants and female servants. That's the same term that Hannah's using and that Mary's using, your female servant. In those days I will pour out my spirit and they shall prophesy. Uh, let's learn from Mary's Magnificat. You've got an introduction in three strophes, just to, to begin with the, the opening. My soul does what? You already know this, right? Magnifies, or in other words, glorifies the Lord. And my spirit does what? Rejoices. Get it? Enjoy God, glorify God. You got it? Okay. Um, magnifies, glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices, enjoys God, my Savior. Hannah prayed, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth smiles at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Now notice this, the way Mary puts it, playing off of Hannah's song. Mary says, my Savior. News message to everybody, including I love you, my Roman Catholic friends, but Mary needs a Savior. She said it right there. Is she immaculate and sinless and will just be assumed so she's not? No, no, no. She is a mortal sinner acknowledging that God is her Savior. Right there. Now, the, the three strophes, number one, she talks about God's personal grace in redeeming me. It's okay. In fact, it's really good. You, we really want you, God wants you, to embrace and rejoice and be soul-filled by the fact that God has saved you. In fact, if you don't know that God has saved you and you're not set on fire by that, I really want to pray with you and talk with you after this service or this week. Let's get connected. Because if you are born again in God, if you know Jesus, you're on fire about it. And you can talk about how God has saved you. I've, we've got personal testimonies from our officers elect this afternoon. I love hearing these and reading these. Um, he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. You see the same connection with Hannah's language there. Let's go on to the secondly, the second strophe. Don't just talk about yourself, though. Connect it with the way God works, God's gospel and kingdom work. And you see this in the second stroke. You're dealing with God's prevailing pattern, not just his personal salvation for me personally, but also his overarching plot line in history, his prevailing pattern of revolutionary grace. God chooses and saves the least and strikes down the proud and the haughty. That's basically the way God works, okay? all the way through the Old Testament and through Jesus in the New Testament. Blessing all the humble who fear him and bringing down the prideful, mighty, and rich. They will be scattered in their own thoughts, as smart as dictators and people who run the world think they are. They will be stricken down within their own thoughts. I mean, in other words, their own schemes are gonna bring them down. That's the way God works. It's revolutionary grace. Um, he scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He's brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. I mean, Mary, come on. Mary's the one? Yeah. Little girl from Nazareth? Yeah. Psalm 138 of David, verse 6. For though the Lord is high, 
he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. In other words, he knows who you are, and you will be judged, but he has no communion with you. Um, Hannah's song, of course, goes into this heavily, talk no more so very proudly, let not arrogance come from your mouth, a warning. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him all actions are weighed. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. What about Jesus? Speaking of the Beatitudes, Luke 6, 20 and 21, Jesus lifts up his eyes, says this, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you shall laugh. So from that overall plot line, we go back to where does it connect with? It connects with the covenant promises God made to our fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and running through Abraham and David and the seed and the promised Messiah. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, and he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. Remember Micah 5 prophesies that the Messiah will be born in Bethlehem. How does Micah end? Chapter 7, verse 20. You shall... You will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. Psalm 98.3, he has remembered his steadfast love, his chesed, and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen this salvation, right? Which brings us back to, this is an amazing prophecy. At the end of Hannah's song, at the end of Hannah's song, understand, In the days of the judges, there is no king in Israel. There has never been a king in Israel at Hannah's lifetime. And there's definitely not talk at this point of a Messiah because you don't even have a king yet, right? But notice the way she ends her song. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken into pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth, not just the Canaanites, not just the Philistines. He's the Lord of the earth. He will give strength to his king. Wait a minute, we don't have a king. Who's he talking about? Who's she talking about? And exalt the horn of his mashiko. It's the same term as Psalm 2, the messianic psalm that's like kind of the linchpin of the whole Old Testament pointing us to Jesus. Same term. So, amazing. Now back to David's invitation for you and me. Magnify the Lord with me. You got David, not just to Israel back then, but to you right now, by the grace of God, inviting you into the worship of God our Savior. Will you come? Will you come and magnify the Lord? Uh, Let me say this as we kind of close out here. Do do I make God any greater by magnifying him? No, it's, it's kind of like using a telescope and seeing how awesome the galaxies are. I'm simply beginning to see and to show to others who God is. This is what we're talking about here. So, magnify the Lord. Magnify the Lord with me. Could you, will you do it? Will you turn your heart and soul over to God and be set free in the gospel? It's a different way of living. It's a different way of seeing. It's a different heart song for you, for your children, for your life, for your household. So today I want to invite you in as David does. Let God guide you to your great goal. Come to the Lord and be raised up. Come to him humble and open yourself and say, I'm all in. I'm yours. I rejoice in you. You're my God. I love you. You are awesome. Now and forevermore in Jesus' name. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org slash connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.